The day after he died, the headline to the obituary in the Telegraph read, Peter Pritchard was the last of the old-time agents who got the Beatles their live gig with Ed Sullivan. Americans of a certain age, of course, remember that uh, The Ed Sullivan Show was a kind of modern vaudeville a variety show that families across the country would watch on Sunday nights. Maybe the entertainment was uneven by today's standards, but by 1963 and 1964, Ed Sullivan's show would overtake that of his uh, main competitor in that time slot, The Steve Allen Show, which uh, now would be the model for future late night shows. Anyway, never mind Steve Allen. We're talking about Ed Sullivan and his talent agents. We'll be right back. Hi, Ariana Grande here. <laughs> and I wanted to say I love the Beatles 60 podcast because, you know, following the Beatles 60 podcast, each episode gives you a look into our world. <laughs> Groovers, listen. The interwebs are full of empty infotainment and the same old, same old about Beatles trivia. You deserve the real story. And what a trip. <laughs> Go deeper with the Beatles 60 podcast. The story from here just gets more amazing for you every day. Peace and love. I'm out. Ariana Grande. <laughs> How do you say it? I can't put a Ariana Grande. Sounds like I'm getting myself a cup of coffee or something. Ariana Grande. I'll take an Ariana. Can I get an Ariana Grande? No cream. Hold the sugar. <laughs> peace and love. Peace and love. Ed was keenly interested in whatever was popular in Europe at any given time. Sullivan's town scout, Jack Babb, relied on Peter Pritchard, who was a London-based journalist and author who had a keen eye for talent and trends. Babb was like a middleman connecting Pritchard and Sullivan. Uh, Babb spent most of his time in the States, but summers in Europe working closely with Pritchard. Pritchard was a friend of Brian Epstein's. In a way, Sullivan and Epstein were already connected via Babb and Pritchard before they'd even heard of each other. Pritchard and Babb, Babb and Pritchard, both were aware of the Beatles in late 1963. That's hardly surprising since all of Britain was also aware of the Beatles by then. In fact, it's key for us now to keep in mind that British society's broad public consciousness of Beatlemania came in October and November of 1963. Mid-October, Sunday night at the London Palladium, televised nationally on ITV. London airport mania on Halloween when the group returned from Sweden. And then the Royal Variety performance on November 4th. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. Yes, the mania had been building since many months earlier, but it was now that their suddenly front-page news and the mania is being reported in the press around the world, including, for example, the New York Times. Capital's Canadian label had been pressing and releasing the Beatles throughout 1963, by the end of December 1963, I Want to Hold Your Hand is released by Capital for U.S. distribution. By December, the Beatles were very ready for America, but this didn't just happen after Capital started pressing the singles for U.S. consumption the day after Christmas 1963. It was negotiated way before that and agreed with a handshake when Epstein and Sullivan met at the Hotel Del Monaco on Manhattan's Upper East Side on the 11th of November. Before that, Epstein was already headed to New York to promote Billy J. Kramer, 
The Sullivan meeting was at the suggestion of Pritchard, who assured Epstein that he could get the Beatles on the show. But wait a minute, wait a minute, let's go back to that Halloween scene at the airport. I think you know where I'm going with this. There was this fairy tale, a made-up story, that Ed Sullivan witnessed Beatlemania at the airport in London on Halloween in 1963. People still believe this, even though it's been confidently debunked. In fact, I believed it just a month ago, probably. <laughs> the airport was filled with adolescents eagerly anticipating the Beatles' return from Sweden. This was the 31st of October, and supposedly, Ed Sullivan and his wife happened to be passing through and witnessed the remarkable response the group received from their maniacal fans. An episode of Obadiah McDougall Jones's excellent podcast, Gimme Some Truth, quotes Michael Braun's book, Love Me Do, The Beatles' Progress, which specifically quotes Ed Sullivan saying, I remember the first time I saw them but notes that this tall tale was debunked by a 2006 book titled Impresario, The Life and Times of Ed Sullivan that presents a compelling case as to why it's extremely unlikely that Ed Sullivan was in London on that particular evening. Well, you know, Sullivan and his wife were in Europe, including London, that summer, but they returned to New York in September, returning to his weekly show on CBS and his bi-weekly entertainment column in the, the New York Daily News. Sullivan would already have seen the extensive front-page attention the Beatles were getting in the London newspapers. He apparently read reports of the airport scene published on the 1st of November, and in his mind maybe deliberately confused the timing of these headlines with other Beatlemania reporting he'd seen over the summer. People close to him explained that Sullivan was in the habit of vaguely weaving episodic memories together for the edutainment value, for impact. He would offer various accounts of how he brought the Beatles onto his show. The stories varied depending on his mood or the person he was speaking to. The London airport story was offered as evidence of Sullivan's bold pop music impresario abilities. His made-up story even made it into the Beatles' inner circle before they flew to America in February. Uh, Harrison repeats it in the Armed Forces radio interview in Paris at the end of January. This kind of Entertaining misinformation has been repeated in books over the years and persists, even 60 years on, in social media comments, for example. This folklore never dies. <laughs> anyway, this one is silly just on the face of it. By Halloween 1963, Ed Sullivan already knew perfectly well who the Beatles were. Go ahead and believe the airport fairy tale if you enjoy living in a world of fantasy. But if you want to make sense of how they got on The Ann Sullivan Show, the real story, better to understand the following. So, let's back up to that moment back in mid-November, just before Epstein was to fly to New York to promote Billy J. Kramer, which is the key moment of the real story. Epstein being informed that an Ed Sullivan appearance could definitely be arranged. That knowledge was all he needed. So that's key. Well, how did we get to the point where Pritchard could assure Epstein of this confidently? What was discussed between Pritchard and Babb in the period after the Palladium and Royal Variety appearances making the news globally, but before Epstein left for New York a couple of weeks later, what happened that in those couple of weeks? We know that Pritchard had already been impressed by the Beatles' popularity and skill. Remember, he's a friend of Epstein's. And he suggested to Bab that he book them for the upcoming season of The Ed Sullivan Show, but Bab wasn't convinced. More up, more up, more up. So... There wasn't complete consensus that it would work. Bab still doubted that the Beals would appeal to the American audience as they hadn't yet achieved any success in the U.S. market. But I guess that makes sense, doesn't it? Not too weird to think that. He dismissed Pritchard's suggestion and was reluctant to book the Beatles for his show. That's weird because Pritchard had already contacted Ed Sullivan himself 
who already uh, agreed to the idea in principle. Bab was the only doubter, you know, so Pritchard and Sullivan are on board. It's just Bab who's like, mm, I don't know. Okay, now what follows is what makes Pritchard the hero. You ready? Are you ready for it? What follows is what makes Pritchard the hero of the story, the one who was intent on making it happen. Pritchard didn't give up, and he reached out to his friend Epstein, who was coincidentally, as we've already said, already about to leave for New York. As I already mentioned a few minutes ago, Pritchard told Epstein that he could get the Beatles on The Ed Sullivan Show, which was considered the ultimate platform for breaking into the American market. So that's quite a thing to be assured. I assure you, we can get your artists on the show. Boom, 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 boom. So he offered to negotiate a deal with Sullivan, meaning Pritchard offered to negotiate a deal with Sullivan, who um, had already confirmed a booking. Uh, Epstein preferred to make the pitch himself in person. I think we understand why. Epstein met Sullivan in person at his suite, meaning uh, at Epstein's suite uh, at the Delmonico, and agreed to schedule the Beatles for three shows. They couldn't have been sure at the moment that it was going to be a win-win, though. Not at all. You know, this is back in November. Uh, Capital was uh, more than a month away from pressing the single for the U.S. Uh, release on Boxing Day in 1963. And what about Jack Babb, the doubter in the middle? Doo-wop a poo. He, um, he probably didn't mind that they went around them. He accepted Sullivan's decision uh, although he was still skeptical about the Beatles' potential. He's like, okay, we'll see. Go ahead, guys. Put them on the show. Don't listen to me. <laughs> then, by luck, America caught the mania rapidly, really rapidly. At the time of the Epstein-Sullivan handshake, the Beatles were barely heard of in America, despite some coverage of uh, the British mania itself as a news item uh, in the papers and on TV in the States. Let's get this sequence really clear. The handshake deal on the 11th of November doesn't, um, doesn't make the news until a month later. On the 15th of December, the Sunday New York Times reports, and this is the exact headline verbatim, British rock and roll group signed for three Ed Sullivan shows. British rock and roll group. I wonder who that is. <laughs> of course, the Beatles are referred to by name in the article itself, but how funny that they went from zero name recognition in December to John Paul, George, and Ringo, household names in America, by the end of January. It's like zero to a hundred in a second, you know? Maybe it was predictable. Maybe Epstein and Sullivan both felt confident a month earlier that it all could happen before the boys landed in New York on the 7th of February. But there was still some risk that the nation wouldn't be hyped up enough by then. You know? What if the nation wasn't hyped up enough and, and they got on the show, you know, and there wasn't all this screaming? <laughs> they took a confident risk in November. I think, I think they knew pretty much uh, how it was going to go down. Since, since the mania happened in other places, why wouldn't it happen in the States, after all? So before their historic appearance on the Ed Sullivan show, the Beatles had already made some impact on the American music scene. The single, I Want to Hold Your Hand, was released by Capitol Records on December 26, 63, as we've already said, after a, uh, a Washington, D.C. radio station obtained a, a copy of the U.K. single and played it on the air, creating a huge demand for the record. And that one D.C. station even uh, made a, a, a tape recording of it, and, and other DJs were playing it around the country. Epstein, of course, uh, didn't just get them booked on Ed Sullivan. Their U.S. television debut was pre-recorded in the U.K. and broadcast in the United States on the Jack Pa show uh, on the 3rd of January. And uh, they, they would play live at Carnegie Hall on the 12th of February. Uh, this is uh, via Sid Bernstein, right? But the Ed Sullivan Show would be their first live performance on American nationwide television. A really big deal on a really big shoe. 
Well, let's, uh, let's just look at January after the Jack Parr show. On January 10th, 64, VJ Records, a Chicago-based label that had the rights to some of the Beatles' early recordings, released Introducing the Beatles, an album that contained most of the songs from their UK debut album, Please Please Me. The album was uh, delayed several times due to legal disputes and financial troubles, but it finally came out 10 days before Capitol Records, the U.S. subsidiary of EMI, uh, released Meet the Beatles, which featured songs from their second UK album, for the most part, with the Beatles. Meet the Beatles topped the album charts for 11 weeks and helped to generate interest in the Beatles, who uh, scored their first number one hit in the U.S. with I Want to Hold Your Hand on January 18th, uh, 64. The VJ album reached number two on the Billboard album chart, behind Meet the Beatles. By the end of January 64, incredible as it sounds now, the Beatles, as I said, had become a household name in the United States thanks to the efforts of Pritchard, Epstein, Sullivan, uh, and the fans who requested their songs on the radio. Uh, Jack Babb, who had doubted the Beatles' appeal, had to admit that he was wrong. He later said, I was the biggest skeptic in the world but I became the biggest fan. But all four, Epstein, Pritchard, Babb, and Sullivan, they were all similar types of guys. They were all theatrical, make-it-happen types. And all four considered their territory to include both sides of the Atlantic. These are very transatlantic theatrical people. So another key observation, though, is that Epstein and Pritchard both represented the Beatles well and were involved to an extent that wasn't typical for the show. Normally, Bab would be uh, more involved with Ed, and Ed wouldn't uh, tailor shows around a guest in this special way. Having Pritchard go around Bab and put the word in with Sullivan, in effect, brought an understanding of the Beatles' specialness to Sullivan's direct attention. Even more important, Epstein's determination to be directly involved with these American impresarios meant that the Beatles' interests were taken into consideration at every step, in detail. In other words, through Pritchard and Epstein and their direct contacts with Sullivan, the artist, in this case the Beatles, uh, was promoted and cared for in exactly the right way. Had Bab been in the middle, just doing the routine recruiting for the show, it would have put the artist at arm's length from the show's planning. Pritchard and Epstein did the right thing by going the right to Sullivan, uh, negotiating as equals. These variety shows didn't necessarily intend to push artists around, but the routine process would sort of entail a one-treatment-fits-all approach. Not so for the Beatles. So that's something to consider, too. That's part of the brilliance of Brian Epstein. Like John said, John Lennon said... Brian was a beautiful guy, Brian Epstein. He was an intuitive, theatrical guy, and he knew he had something, and he presented us well. The Beatles were global news more than three months before they landed at JFK in February. Um, the truth is that the connection was almost inevitable. But in retelling the story, I've already spoken 1,400 words. It's too complicated to retell this kind of a story, uh, say, in an interview, you know, so we can understand why Sullivan would make up a sort of simplified story. The Sullivan at the airport story must have appealed to these guys, you know, more than any genuine retelling. So, so we get a fairy tale. And the fairy tale was repeated by Sullivan, by the Beatles, by Epstein, and so many gullible biographers and historians. And, you know, that it's circulated all over social media these days. In our Facebook group, which, by the way, is no longer hijacked by scammers, yay! Uh, a member of the group c commented the other day, oh, wait a minute, maybe this was on YouTube. They commented, for years, I've heard the story about Sullivan encountering Beatlemania at the airport in England and deciding he wanted them for his show. There's probably multiple versions of what really happened, and who knows? But 
Are there really multiple versions of reality? Suddenly, the world I used to know, I see it differently. You woke me from a dream, now here's reality.